All right, so uh, we are in a series that we have been calling Taking Ground, and um, we've been camped in the book of Joshua as we believe that the same promise uh, that they uh, were called to pursue and live into as the people of God is similar to the promises that we as the present day people of God are called to live into. Amen? Amen. And so as we uh, took some time and we looked at this text and we thought about of what we would uh, what we would do and what we would say, um, it became really clear to us that as we were we were looking at this, we saw that though this is uh, the promised land, all right, though this is a, a land that God said to them, it is yours. I have given it to you. What we found is that there was still a price they had to pay to acquire it. Yeah. Amen. And I love that because it kind of reminds me of something that the great Denzel Washington once said. Do you guys want to hear what he said once? <laughs> All right. So Denzel Washington, one, one time he said this. He said, ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. Okay. See, there's something about the grind. There's something about difficulty, right, that just makes us stronger. It makes us wiser. It makes us appreciate more the things that we have. Amen. And so, uh, though the wilderness was uh, not the will of God for the people of God, uh, but in fact it was uh, something that they went through because of their unbelief and disobedience, God still used it to prepare them for everything he had for them, right? And as Brandon so beautifully put it last week, you know, God will use wilderness experiences in your life to build a strength in you and to build resilience in you, amen? But one of the unintended consequences of a wilderness experience is that you can come out on the other side with a very hard and calloused heart. That can happen. See, the, the devil has a plan for your wilderness experience, just like God has a plan for your wilderness experience, right? And in your wilderness experience, maybe you experienced trauma. But what did Rebecca say a couple weeks ago? I loved it when she said it, right? That trauma blocks love, right? But love the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Are y'all awake? Yep. <laughs> but love heals trauma. It heals trauma. And so as the, the people of God are getting ready to take this land, God is uh, going to give them. We see God making these final attempts to, uh, to thaw and to draw and to woo their hearts, Right? Uh, we see this early in the book of Joshua. Uh, we see that they set up memorials, that um, uh, they set this up after they, they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. We see them uh, endure circumcision, that, that the, uh, the children of Israel that were about to go into the promised land had not been circumcised, so they get circumcised, right? And then they take some time to, to heal and rest, thank God, right? So, so you see them resting, you see them healing, uh, you see them uh, celebrate Passover, right? And at the end of the Passover, God says this to them. He says, today I've rolled away your shame of slavery in Egypt, right? After that, then we see Joshua comes face to face with the, the pre-incarnate Christ. We, we see him come face to face with the commander of the army of the Lord, and it turns into this worship service, right? And so uh, why all the drama is the question, I think. You're reading through the book of Joshua, and you're just probably asking yourself, why all the drama? Why is God doing all this? What's going on? Why is he making them jump through so many hurdles before they go in and possess the land? Let me tell you why. The reason why is because private purity is the basis for public power. Did you hear what I said? Say it again. I will. <laughs> Private purity is the basis for public power. In the kingdom of God, a heart yielded to the Lord is to success what a safety is to a gun. Now, what is a safety on a gun meant to do? Okay, so a safety on a gun is meant to keep you from fatally wounding yourself or someone you love inadvertently, yeah? And so when you have a heart that is yielded to the Lord, he can bless you, and you're not a spiritual danger to other people. Good. 
I needed that. Thank you. I was just trying to, I was trying to make sure people were in the room. When you have a heart yielded to the Lord, he can bless you and you turn that blessing around and you give it to other people. Why? Because it's not about the gift for you. All you care about is the giver. Fam, listen, listen, listen. We will not drift into devotion or glide into godliness. If you want everything God has for you, it's going to come at a price. You know what that price is? It's your heart. And so we're going to look at a cautionary tale today. Something happens in Joshua chapter 7. Uh, something happens in the Valley of Achor that shows us the result of an unyielded heart. That we see in this story what actually happens when we desire as the people of God, because this, this was someone who was known by God, who knew God. We, we're going to see what happens when we choose hidden ground over holy ground. Amen? You guys ready to go on the, on the, on the train with me? All right. Don't like y'all were cool during worship. Don't start like getting sleepy now. OK. All right. So Joshua chapter seven, starting in verse 19, it says this. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, it is true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make a search. They ran into the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan had said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. They took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites. Then they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. Verse 24, then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, and everything he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and buried their bodies. Hmm. There's another passage that I want to I read to you where the Valley of Achor is, men, is mentioned. It's Hosea chapter 2. It says this in verse 13. But then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the Valley of Trouble, the Valley of Achor, into a door, into a gateway of hope. Now, in Joshua chapter 6, God is uh, giving uh, the people of God a strategy for how they're going to go in and attack Jericho. But not only does he give them a strategy for how they're going to attack this city, he also gives them the strategy and instructions for what they're supposed to do after the battle is won. And this is what God says to them. He says, there is a ban on this city. Everything here is devoted for destruction. Do not take anything. Utterly destroy this place. And if you covet their stuff, if you take their stuff, you will bring a curse onto Israel and you'll bring trouble onto yourself. Does that sound pretty clear to you? So they go into the battle. Right, they walk around as, as Brandon showed us last week. They they march around the city. Right, the walls come tumbling down. They go in. They completely destroy the city. But one man, Achan, decides to steal some plunder. From there, God pulls back his protection. God pulls back his presence. God pulls back his power. And then the people of God they go into another fight. They go into another war with a much smaller city and a much smaller army, and they get routed. And so as they're trying to reconcile, man, what's going on here? What's going on here? God isolates Achan, and he's found out to be the person that's responsible for this. Now, when I was a kid, I, I've told some of you guys this story before, but I think it fits. When I was a kid, I saw a movie that traumatized me. 
That movie is called, maybe you've seen it before, it's called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> creepy, creepy. And, and I, guess it's, I guess it's a morality tale, right? And so you got these five kids that are fortunate enough to get admission into the Chocolate Factory. And what you learn as the movie goes on is that uh, four of these five kids have these, these flaws, right? These like big flaws about them that kind of get uncovered and become the reason why they get kicked out and rejected from the factory. Well, there's one of these kids that are uh, in the factory with them. His name is Augustus Gloop. Remember him? Augustus Gloop. Now, Augustus's flaw was gluttony. Now, now, what is gluttony? All right, gluttony is taking something good, taking something necessary, and cramming it in until we're sick and we're ready to explode. All right, that's what gluttony is. And so if you remember, uh, Augustus ran over to this river of chocolate, and he starts drinking the, river, the, the chocolates in the river, and everyone's trying to get him to stop, and he won't stop. And then he falls into the river, and then he gets sucked up into a pipe, and he gets ejected out of the factory. When you're a kid watching that, you're like, what is going on here? <laughs> See, we all have an Augustus gloop in us. We all have an Aiken in us. And no matter what your sin of choice is, whether it's gluttony or covetousness or anything else, Every single sin tells us something about the way that sin infects and affects all of us. That there's something, um, there's something in our hearts uh, that we um, have this proclivity to crave immoderately. That there's something deep in all of us, in every single one of us. There's something in us that we, we want so bad we become aching to get it, right? There is an, an, an infection and a disorder in us. Uh, St. Augustine called it concupiscence, right? That sin makes us all addicted to something. That's what the story of Aiken's about, guys. That's what it's about. That there is a craving, there's, there's something in us. We are all in the grip of craving. We're all in the grip of craving. We're all... Uh, craving something immoderately in our, in our lives. And so this story shows us three things, and I'll be brief from here. It shows us three things. Number one, it shows us the depth of our craving. Number two, it shows us the structure of our craving and the healing for our craving. All right, so we're gonna look at the depth of it, the structure of it, and the healing for it. Amen? All right, so first, the depth of it. Now, when Achan took spoil from Jericho, he knew what he was doing. Think about this for a second. When he took it, it was in full view of knowing exactly what he was doing. He knew the cost, and yet he took it anyway. When Joshua confronted him and said, hey, why did you do this? What, what did he say? He said, yeah, I did it. Now, notice he didn't say, what? You're, you're going to do what? This was a capital offense? No. He knew what he was doing. And so what this tells us is that our craving, uh, our Heart's desire for things is so strong that it overcomes our conscience. It overcomes our reason. Eventually, it overcomes our fear of consequences and even our own sense of self-preservation. Sin so affects us and infects us that we can crave something so badly that we take it even to the degree that to get it is to lose everything. That's what Aiken did. It was suicide. It was suicide. Aiken is an example of what sin craving does to the human heart. It takes good and necessary things and it disorders it. Okay, that's what it does. All right, so that's the depth of our craving. Second, I want to show you the structure of our craving. Because I've already made this point that we all have desires in our hearts. We all have these cravings for things that are good and necessary. Um, but we have this ability, even though they're good and necessary, we have this ability to disorder them so that not only are they no longer good, they're destructive to us, okay? And the point from desire to destruction has a predictable pattern. There's a predictable path, all right? Destruction doesn't just pounce on you, all right? And so to quote the great poet Meek Mill, there's levels to this, okay? Levels. 
When our inordinate desire and craving meets an opportunity for indulgence, there are four steps to the cliff. Okay, Aiken said, I saw, I weighed, I wanted, and I took. Okay, I saw, I weighed, I wanted, and I took. All right, so let's look at those. So he saw. Now, the word saw uh, doesn't mean notice. It can actually be better translated as behold. Now, what does behold mean? Behold means to look, look, look. To behold means to hold it, to put it at the center of our attention, to gaze at it. And so the first step to temptation is to move beyond noticing to gazing. And in doing so, you open yourself up to the next step, which is weighing. Now, I want you to think about what Aiken saw. All right, think about what he saw. He said he saw a beautiful robe, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold. Now, the question is, I, I'm just thinking, if I'm interviewing this guy, and he tells me he saw, the question for me is, how do you know how many shekels were in that bag? Oh, I saw there were 200 shekels. How, how do you know there's 200 shekels? Like, you can notice five, right? But you can't notice 200. Okay, he said, I noticed 200. But the only way you can do that is you got to gaze. You got to count. You got to weigh it. Now, the theological term for what he was doing here is he was giving them glory. All right. And the Hebrew word uh, for, for, uh, for glory literally means weight, but in a spiritual sense, it means importance. And so here's what was going on Achan knew about the glory of God and the, the glory and the honor of God. He knew about the glory and honor of his people. But when he waited on a scale of his heart, his inordinate desire for other things won out. That's what happened. He gave them glory. And let me just tell you this. Whatever you give glory to in your life, you serve. Even if it's a corrupt master. And so this led him to the next step. I saw, I weighed, I wanted. Uh, another word for wanted is coveted, right? Now, what's coveting? Uh, uh, to covet is more than just desiring something that doesn't belong to you, right? Uh, to covet is to worship that thing. It's adoring that thing. And so whatever you glorify and ascribe weight to in your heart, you will worship and feel drawn to, which then leads you to the fourth step. I took. That's the structure for how cravings go from desire to destruction in our lives, right? And so here's what I feel like the Lord showed me in this passage, and here's what I want to articulate to you. Um, Achan cherished the things devoted to the Lord more than he cherished and was devoted to the Lord. And the consequence of his false worship was that he became what he worshiped. He became devoted for destruction. Joshua said to Achan, because you brought trouble on us, the Lord will bring trouble on you. And so Achan died to remove sin from the camp. Achan was cursed. Achan was dragged out and made a spectacle. He was burned up with fire. And through his death, God's presence, God's power, God's protection was restored to the Israelites. Clara, you guys can come back. I'm done. This is what happened. The story of Achan is one of the best pictures in all of Scripture of the wrath and fear of God against sin. And not only does it show us the cost of a heart that is unyielded to the Lord, but it also shows us exactly what Jesus Christ came to do for us. It shows us that, right? Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Or if you guys will allow me to rephrase this and contextualize it based on what we read today. Another way to say this is that Jesus, who was nothing like Achan, became Achan so that you and I can be brought closer to God. All right. That's what's going on here. Jesus endured trouble so that it wouldn't have to be poured out on us. 
Jesus died. Jesus uh, died not just to remove sin from the camp, but to remove even the strong craving of sin from our hearts. Jesus was cursed. He was dragged out and made a spectacle. Jesus suffered all the fire of God's wrath. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I can enjoy God's presence, God's power, and God's protection today. Amen. So we all, as sinners, we deserve the fate of Achan. But Jesus is willing to exchange that fate for a pardon and switch places with us today. And though in our hearts, though we on our own are a people devoted for destruction, Jesus has come so that we may hide behind his holiness. Though in our hearts we are prone to choose hidden ground, Jesus has come so he can place us on holy ground. Amen? Amen. And so here's where the healing from sinful craving comes in. Okay, here's where the healing comes in. Because if you've gone from I saw to I weighed to I wanted to I took, and your life is falling apart because you feel like you've gone too far, you can repent. Today, God is here and he's saying, I can turn your valley of Acor into a door of hope. And maybe you've already been stoned and you've been burned up because you feel like you've progressed to a place where your cravings has destroyed your life. But God says no. If you will repent and if you will come back and if you will gaze upon the beauty of my son, and ascribe the weight of glory to him and make him the object of your worship, I will rebuild your life from the ground up. Did your team lose in football last week? Like, I'm trying to figure out. Like, I'm preaching way better than y'all respond. Like, y'all gloomy today. Um, I saw a movie... Um, a while back with my wife. Now, if you know me, I don't really watch a lot of movies. Most movies watch me, okay? I fall asleep even at the theater. Uh, but remember at the, the beginning of the pandemic where there were no sports on TV? I, I literally wanted to gouge my eyes out like it was rough, okay? Um, there was no sports on TV, so I started watching a lot more movies with Amy, and we watched a movie on Netflix, and... In so many words, there's a, a main character who went into the slums of India to rescue a kid, and they have this moment in the movie. Um, and one thing about movies is, like, I'm always ready for the gospel moment. Like, I'm always ready for something that applies. And so this guy says to the kid, you know, he starts to kind of confess some things that he was struggling with and what was going on. And the kid just kind of out of nowhere says something so profound. I had to, turn, I had to literally pause the movie and look at Amy. I was like, what did he just say? He said this to the man in the movie. He said, you drown not from falling into the river, but by staying submerged in it. You drown, listen, you drown not from falling into the river, but by staying submerged in it. Friends, listen to me. You need not stay submerged in anything today. But the mercy and grace of God. Amen. So we're going to pray in a minute. Um, I'm actually going to uh, invite some of my friends. I, I just told a few of them, hey, if, if, if the Lord will put anything on your heart, uh, would you come forward? But we're going to pray in a minute. But this is an invitation today. As we think about the promised land, as we think about this idea that God has something for you and me, that we've come out of a wilderness. Can I just say, maybe the last two years, it's been a wilderness, but man, it's time for us to walk in promise, yeah? But for us to get there, you cannot have an unyielded heart. It will literally block you from what God's trying to do, amen?